Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Verdict by Agatha Christie. This is the Samuel French acting edition. As always, I'm going to read out the blurb, share a few of my thoughts at the end, and I'm also going to check out some of my tabs. Uh, I will say, I've not seen this perform live. I have um, read, I think, all of Christie's other plays at this point, and I've seen Witness for the Prosecution and um, The Mousetrap. But actually, I think this is probably the one that I would most like to see actually performed. So, uh, the blurb. Carl Hendrick is a brilliant professor who, with his wife and her cousin, has fled persecution in his homeland and finds himself ensconced in London. The play concerns itself with the relationship the professor has with the women in his life. His wife Anya, who is suffering from a progressively debilitating disease, her cousin and carer Lisa, and Helen Rollander, a spoiled student who takes up private lessons with the professor. Not a murder mystery or who done it, but a not a murder mystery or a whodunit, but a profound and thoughtful piece that deals with the human experience. Delving deeply into the psychology of relationships and moral philosophy, this is the story of a misguided idealist who loves so intensely it becomes ultimately destructive and unattainable. Um, I guess it's not a murder mystery or a whodunit, but it does have murder in it. So uh, Lester here is talking about the professor. The professor, he's wonderful. We all think so, you know. Everybody's ter terrifically clean. Everybody's terrifically keen. The way he puts things, all the past seems to come alive. I mean, when he talks about it, you see what everything means. He's pretty unusual, isn't he? He has a very fine brain. And uh, we get this introduction of this girl who, um, she wants private lessons with him. And um, Lisa says, we could do with the money. And Carl says, I know, I know, but it's not a question of money. It's the time you see, Lisa. I really haven't got the time. There are two boys, Sidney Abrahamson, you know him, and another boy, a coal miner's son. They're both keen, desperately keen, and I think they've got the stuff in them. But they're handicapped by a bad superficial education. I've got to give them private time if they're to have a chance, and they're worth it, Lisa. They're worth it. Do you understand? And uh, this kind of idealism is really what comes back to haunt him. And uh, here, the word, the word fag is, is uh, like British slang for a cigarette. Um, as far as I know, I think it predates the homophobic slur, so I definitely don't mean that. Um, so Mrs. Roper says, I got the washing and I got a few more fags for the professor. He was right out again. She takes a packet of cigarettes from a shopping bag and puts them on the desk. Oh, don't they carry on when they run out of fags? You should have heard Mr. Fremantle at my last place. Screen blue murder he did if he hadn't got a fag. Always sarcastic to his wife he was. They were incompatible, you know. He had a secretary, saucy cat. When the divorce case came up, I could have told them a thing or two from what I saw. I would have done too, but for Mr. Roper. I thought it was only right, but he said, no, Ivy, never spit against the ri never spit against the wind. Again, I just think some good characterization. And it's also, I would say, like fairly working class slang as well. So uh, the fact that she uses that term rather than calling them cigarettes is quite indicative of the class of her character. And then we have Anya, who's like the old wife, uh, the, the guy's wife, and she's very ill. And um, she says, um, it's not as though I'm gay and amusing like I used to be. I'm just an invalid now, fretful and cross with nothing amusing to say or do. Carl says, no, no, my dear. And Anya says, if I were only dead and out of the way, Carl could marry a handsome young wife who would help him in his career. And Carl says, you would be surprised if you knew how many men's careers have been ruined by marrying young, handsome wives when they themselves are middle aged. And um, uh, Carl's brought some flowers and she says, I don't want to be reminded of spring, spring in this horrible city. You remember the woods and how we went and picked the little wild daffodils? Our life was so happy then, so easy. We didn't know what was coming. Now the world is hateful, horrible, all drab grey, and our friends are scattered and most of them are dead, and we have to live in a foreign country. And then Helen's trying to plead her case. She's the kind of the rich one who wants him to take her on as a student. And she says, do you mean you think he's got a better brain than I have? And Carl says, no, I would not say that, but he has, shall I say, a greater desire for learning. And then Helen says, oh, I see, you think I'm not serious? Carl doesn't answer. But I am serious. The truth is you're prejudiced. You think that because I'm rich, because I've been a Deb and done all the silly things that Debs do, you think I'm not in earnest. And I thought that was interesting, like the prejudice against her for being rich, because it's true, he kind of is. Uh, Rolander says, the Spanish have a proverb, take what you want and pay for it, says God. And uh, Carl, eventually Carl kind of agrees to take her on. And she says, she knows a little hotel German and he says, uh, you must study German. It is impossible to get anywhere without knowing French and German thoroughly. You should study German grammar and composition three days a week. I am studying both French and German. Hooray. And this is quite telling. Um, Anya says, it is she who drinks the tea. She always says we need more tea, but we hardly use any. We drink coffee. Helen says, I suppose these women always pinch things, don't they? And Anya says, and they think we are foreigners and we shall not know. And that's true. That was like... Kind of, I would say, the prevailing uh, British attitude at the time. 
And then uh, the, his wife uh, threatens to kill herself. And this is important because later on she dies. And um, I don't want to go too much into the specifics of what happens because I don't want to spoil it too much. But um, I think this dialogue here is quite telling. Uh, doctor, the doctor says, callous murdering little bitch. That's an era the mark. And I shouldn't worry before you need. Ten to one it will never come to an arrest. Presumably she'll deny everything. And there's got to be evidence, you know. The police may be quite sure who's done a thing, but be unable to make out a case. The girl's father is a very important person. One of the richest men in England. That counts. Carl says, there, I think you are wrong. And the doctor says, oh, I'm not saying anything against the police. If they've got a case, they'll go ahead without fear or favour. All I mean is that they'll have to scrutinise their evidence with extra care. And on the face of it, there can't really be much evidence, you know. Unless, of course, she breaks down and confesses the whole thing. And I should imagine she's much too hard-boiled for that. And then we have a bunch of twists at the end that I don't want to go into, but um, overall, yeah, definitely make it worth reading. I mean, uh, rating time, I gave this a 5 out of 5, actually. It's a cracking little little play. Uh, only takes four women and six men, so a reasonably smallish theatre company could put it on as well. And I'd love to see a performance of it, so once, um, you know, things get a little bit back to normal, hopefully I'll go and see, see a, a performance of it. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Verdict by Agatha Christie. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.